inviting us here, this space, to do this webinar. And Natalie and I will keep it conversational and engaging in the spirit of social media. And I like to remind you all, we all multitaskers, right? So while you are um, watching this webinar, I'll encourage you all to, to um, check out the Training Institute Twitter and um, hashtag MA Coalition to just engage us and use us to practice all of this. Okay, so as we think about the social media, it's been around for more than 10 years, believe it or not. And I have a question for you, Natalie. <laughs> this is a surprise question. So amongst all of the social media platforms that we are discussing today, mm -hmm. which platform do you think is the oldest? Um, at the ones we're discussing, probably Facebook. <laughs> the answer is, we run up. LinkedIn, that I started in 2002. So needless to say, social media is intertwined in our everyday life, then we can't avoid it. So the question is how, we, how well we do it. So today's webinar objectives, at the end of the webinar, we hope you all be able to identify strategies for creating content across different platforms. Define best practices for content planning and understand common, so common social media challenges and the ways to overcome them. Just really quick overall webinar agenda today. We'll go over five common challenges that you all face. Content for each platform, and we'll use case studies and practice that you get to use. Content planning, and then we'll provide some things to remember. And throughout the webinar, we'll use a lot of examples, tools, and tips. Okay, let's go over a chat question. I'm sorry questions. Is your social media content management part of your role at work? This is yes or no questions. Is social media content management part of your role at work? I see that the answer is coming in. Nicely split, right? Is that so? Three quarters? Yeah. Three quarters of you say yes, and then almost one quarter say no. Okay, so this is interesting. Good to know. Okay, so let me close this pull box. Okay, so last year, Natalie and I did social media part one webinar, leveraging social media in your work. And then we went over social media plan with some key elements, which I quickly go over in a second. We talked about content strategy and then provided some tools and resources. And then Nalady is gonna go over again later um, about content strategy a little bit. Okay. So social media plan, so which we discussed last year. So there are a few key, key um, factors that you need to remember. Who your audiences are, your goals and objectives for social media, and what platforms you use, and what content you might be able to use. And then today, um, we like to focus on audience and then goals and objectives, because so, we'll keep coming back to it. These are the things that you need to remember in creating content. Yeah, so we just want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about this first piece, identifying who your target audiences are for your platforms, mainly because this is such a crucial piece in sort of the beginning stages of starting your social media planning. A lot of folks um, understand that social media is an important place to be and it's important for their coalitions or their organizations to be engaging on social media but don't often take that kind of first initial step of really thinking about who they want to engage and which platform might be best for that. So I'm just gonna sort of give you a little bit of a snapshot about what we're talking about, just specifically in terms of ages for each of these platforms. So this graphic sort of outlines the age groups that are using each of these individual platforms. So as you can see, 
from um, the graphic here is about 78% of 18 to 24 year olds are using Snapchat. Snapchat is one of those, you know, very um, complicated and trendy social media that's being used, especially by young, younger age demographic. Um, so that's something to think about because I think a lot of times folks hear about these new social media platforms like Snapchat and think, oh, we need to be there. But if you don't have a specific reason to be reaching out to those audiences or a strategy to use that, that platform, it might not be the best one for you to put energy into. And same thing for Instagram, 71% of 18 to 24 year olds use Instagram. So we're seeing that those two platforms are really heavy with that age demographic. So it's, this really just helps give a snapshot in terms of the ages of the folks that are using, but there's also lots of information out there about, um, you know, beyond age, what, what people are using in terms of are they young professionals versus are they stay at home moms? Um, are they young people in high school or are they um, folks who are retirees and are sort of looking for that community after leaving the workforce? So there's all kinds of different aspects that can come into play with this as well. So for us in the 84, when we think about who our audiences are, like I mentioned before, the 84 is a Massachusetts Youth Tobacco Prevention Program, and we're funded by the Department of Public Health. So we have a lot of different folks who we're wanting to create relationships with, um, especially through social media. So it's important for us to think about who those people are in terms of our audience. So you can see here, We've identified, obviously, youth being probably our biggest audience that we're looking to reach, the adult advisors that work with the young people. Then we have stakeholders and other partners that kind of work in the tobacco prevention world that aren't necessarily probably on the same platforms that youth are. So for us, it was really important for us to identify who our audiences are and where those audiences might be in terms of the social media platforms that they're using. So when we were thinking about this, today's webinar, um, we wanted to sort of the, all the questions that, are, that come from you. So I know that the, you answered some questions in the registration. So based on your feedback in the registration, and then we asked the question, what challenges do you have? So we came up with five common questions and we'd like to address them. Let's go over them. Okay. So the first question. We don't have enough content to use for social media. What can I do? What can we do? <laughs> so I hear this struggle a lot. And then some people are very stressed about it. And then we could actually feel it in the <laughs> registration from some folks here. So good news is you don't have to come up with your own content all the time. So here's something that, that I want to introduce today. 631 rule. So what that means. So 60% of the content can be curated from external sources. Only 30%, 30% is your own original content. And 10% is promotion. So what does that mean? What are they exactly? So 60% is the curated content. So that could be news articles, that an article that you read everyday life that it could be NPR, New York Times, Boston Globes, or any other content, any other news sources that you see online, or even on the paper. I don't know, you subscribe to the paper anymore. Um, so that's news articles. And then blog posts by somebody else. So many of them come from the, the um, newsletter or news up, the email updates that you sign up for. So keep an eye on the, those, um, the email updates or any content that you might be able to use for social media. And other organizations um, post social, posts on social media, those are really good, that are, uh, good content that you can retweet or share with com comments. Here are some examples. So the left one is by Public Health Institute in California. So they posted an article by cdlab.com. And then you notice that the, they use the hashtag health equity because it's, of course, obviously related to health equity. I just wanted to show some examples and how folks are use um, the hashtag or even tagging here. 
And then right one is by us. And this is a retweet um, of the post by Springboards, uh, Springboard Schools. And then we just use a little bit of emoji here. Mm -hmm. So you notice that, the, um, so these are the example, but did it not just to retweet or just to share the link of the articles? And then there are some comments there. And I, um, I like to think that the, these are adding some personal touch and um, your own perspective to the post. So it's adding value there. Original content. So these are your own blog posts, your publications, uh, white paper fact sheets, or even data from your research. And then sometimes it could be videos or photos that you took. So this is the content that you want the world to know. So you want to get the word, up, word out about your own content. So it's okay to repost. You can post about it today, and then you can post about it next week, even if the same content, just to change a little bit of the tweet or even the, some wording in the Facebook. And then maybe two months from now, you can repurpose it. It is okay. Here's some example. These are just example of um, posting about the blogs here. But uh, you can see that the um, Robert, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they tagged some organization or initiative um, talking about their blog content. And then 023, they use a couple of different hashtags and related to the content that they're talking about, as well as I think hashtag Think Babies NC. It's probably the campaign or some other. Promotional content, here are some examples. It is about the registration for the training uh, webinars or events, like today's webinar. A training institute posted about today's webinar, so that's part of the promotional. Participation in some meetings or some program in the fundraising. Here's, here's some examples. Any EKC Foundation, they posted about their webinar. And then Training Institute, um, they are talking about the health equity cohort. This is a program, and then they're collecting applications back then in December. Again, hashtag health equity. Question number two. I always end up posting the same kind of content. What are the different types of content I can use? This is a great question. <laughs> so, what are the different types of content? So here's an example. Memes, using quotes, infographic, videos, images, and the GIFs. And in some of the, um, the examples here, you can create by using some free online tools available, and then you can Google it and lots and lots of free tools available. And then we'll, we'll give some um, particular example at the end of this webinar as part of the resources. So, there you go. Here's some example. 84 movement. Natalie, you want to talk about this one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like this. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, I think this is actually, was actually a GIF, but it's not animated here um, because it's a still it's a screen capture. But this was just um, a moment for us to, you know, try to focus on wellness. We did a whole kind of week or so where we wanted to encourage our chapters um, to think about giving, doing some self-care and taking care of themselves over the winter months. So uh, just thought that this uh, gift kind of adds to that and, and gives some personality to that, to that uh, post. And I think the right one might be gifts because you can really tell by um, just a screenshot. But now, you know, we all have a smartphone using the iPhone or any other smartphone. It's really easy to find a gift that are, like fit what you're trying to do. So it's just fun. So maybe it's a good way to bring fun to social media. Quotes. So these are created. Um, so the quote, quote images are created by, again, using some free online tools that you can find. And then most of the quotes that are used in social media are aspirational or inspirational. And I personally love using quotes. Um, so this type of post can give positive feelings or sense of purpose. And then those doesn't have to be quotes by famous people. It could be 
by your colleagues or co-workers um, who gave really quote worthy remark. So I might be using quotes from you today. <laughs> I might be using the quotes from all of you that are you, you know, like put in the chat box. So that, that is fine too. Okay, infographic. As you all know, data visualization makes the data more digestible and then more appealing to the audience. And then again, there are a lot of templates for infographic available online as well that you can use. So we talked about a um, few different types. And then I like you, I'd like to remind you all about the goals and objectives that you have. And then again, make sure that whatever you post, whatever, whatever the types that you use, that's that supports your goals and objective. Okay. In the spirit of keeping the content fresh, a yeah, quote. Cool. So here's some example that you can use that a not traditional content, trending. So in Twitter, you can see on the left side that trending, um, trending topics and trending hashtag. And there are some trending content for the other social media platform, right, mm -hmm. Natalie? Okay. So you can use that. And again, as long as it's relevant to what you're trying to achieve, you can use that trending content. Feature staff. So 84 is really good at featuring staff, showcasing the faces of who's behind the scene. And highlighting partners. Give some shout outs to your partners by posting about their accomplishment or initiatives and they'll like that. Mm -hmm. So that's the way to sort of like engaging your partners and kind of and keeping the content fresh. And another one is theme the content. Um, example, for example, the awareness month observance. So particularly like this month, Black History Month, or National STEM Day, or even National Pretzel Day. So, <laughs> <you post it. laughs> so that's fun. Okay. So um, before we dive into different platforms, there's some poll questions. Which social media platform do you use? Which social media platform do you use? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and or LinkedIn. Oh, wow. Yep. This is great. So as we expected, Facebook. Facebook is the highest one, 92%. Twitter, 42%. Instagram, 42%. LinkedIn is 29%. Wow, yeah. Okay, is this what we expected, Molly? I mean, yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. All right. So, here we go. Okay, so now um, we talked about all, type, all different types of content that you can use for social media, and Anali is gonna talk about which types you can yeah. use for which platform? Yeah, so we talked a little, we were just speaking about the different types of content that you can put out there, but it might be helpful to understand which platform is the best to use for that kind of content. So for example, this um, sort of chart here, this image from Hootsuite, which is a really great resource for any and all things social media, and we'll talk about them a little bit later, but they provide this um, sort of graphic here that lists out the different types of posts that are helpful for each platform. So you can see Facebook um, is really a great platform for utilizing videos or GIFs and Facebook Live, things like that. Um, Instagram is great for using the Instagram stories or Instagram Live and posts, um, but maybe not so much for um, different links or things like that. <clears throat> Twitter is really great for pretty condensed uh, fast-paced news and updates. So using Twitter chats or just sending out um, general updates for your organization. And LinkedIn is its own kind of 
body of, uh, of uh, in terms of social media, using a lot of different um, connections and networking through that site. So we're going to focus on the first three for the purposes of this um, for this webinar. So I'm going to break it down a little bit further for you. So in terms of the Facebook, um, in terms of Facebook platform, the kinds of things that we generally see on Facebook are a focusing a lot more on storytelling and more long form um, content sharing. So this is where you'll see longer posts, sort of more opinionated posts, maybe an article posted with a little bit more um, like chunky paragraph of, of, of the post person who's posting his opinion about that article. It's a lot more about your opinions and trying to engage folks in a dialogue. Um, this is the best platform to do that on because it does allow for more long form content posting. Whereas on other platforms, you're kind of limited by the number of characters you use and things like that. It also is a really great place to post video. Um, it you know, allows for a longer video as an, again, opposed to other platforms. So this is really a good space to do that. And engagement on this platform really looks like those comments, um, those likes, people, like I mentioned, posting some sort of think pieces and, and asking folks to engage in a dialogue about them. So I don't know about you, but I have a lot of friends who will post an article and, and some thoughts about it and ask folks for their opinion are. This is also a space where folks ask for you know help on something like hey i'm going on a vacation here what are your thoughts like what are your what would you recommend so there's a lot of different ways to kind of get that engagement on this platform twitter is a lot different so twitter is much more short form again you only have 280 characters it used to be 140 it's now 280 to be able to get your message across so Twitter is really a space that folks go to when they're looking for a fast paced interaction, when they're looking for bite sized pieces of information or news. It's really driven by your values. So people who go and use Twitter often seek out information that aligns with their values in terms of the news that they want to consume or the type of media that they're taking in. So it's really the best platform to get across a lot of key information about your organization or events that you might have coming up, but with really a little embellishment to that. Um, you, you know, this is the best for static images or GIFs. It's not a great place for video, really, um, or more long form um, sort of content like that. For engagement on Twitter, there's a lot of different things you can do. Obviously, asking folks to retweet your messages to try to get the word to spread to as many folks as possible. Um, really, you can ask for folks to weigh in on topics here as well. It is a little bit more tricky to track that conversation unless you're using something like a hashtag, um, but it is a good way to do that. And that sort of goes into the idea of Twitter chats or storms where you're bringing folks together together on Twitter and using a specific hashtag to unify and collect the conversation for a specific purpose. So say you were doing some sort of awareness day, um, like we have our national sort of youth tobacco prevention day, kick butts day, and there's been in the past sometimes Twitter chats going on around that. So folks from tobacco prevention world will come onto Twitter and use that hashtag to all sort of comment and be in a conversation with one another. So Instagram, aka my favorite uh, social media platform, uh, is really, really fun. It is the most mobile friendly of all of the social media platforms, primarily because it's meant to be a mobile social media platform. It is not really meant to be used sort of on a computer, unlike Facebook um, and some, even Twitter. So it's really important to think about that um, when you're using your posts, that folks are probably looking at it on their phones. So this is a great place to utilize video, obviously images, um, to share some more instant um, updates from your, from your organization through especially the Instagram stories, which for those who are not familiar, sort of are very short form videos that compile together over like 24 hours. Uh, and you can sort of watch them all back to back. And it's a way to 
sort of update your audience instantly without having to post a, a static post on your Instagram page. Uh, so it's a great way to, to do that. That's Insta Stories is also the best way if you want to direct people to a website or a post um, because Instagram does not allow you to post links within the a comment or within a, a caption, I mean. So it's best to use Insta Stories for that. So there's a lot of nuances to Instagram, but it is kind of the most engaging of all the platforms, I think, because it really focuses on the visual. And I think that's what folks are really looking for. In terms of engagement, again, similarly to some of the other platforms, use, utilizing comments and likes. Um, and again, those Insta stories and, and tagging other people in your uh, posts and your stories really helps to bring folks to your page. Um, and there's also options to go live on Instagram as well as similarly to Facebook. And then I'd like to remind you all about the audiences, who your audience is, mm -hmm. and then think about which platform that your audience will use. Mm -hmm. So those are all like by each other. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to question number three. All right. How can I leverage conferences, events, or presentation for social media content? So this is a great question. So um, I've seen um, really good opportunity that I came from some events and conferences. And that's a great opportunity to get more engagement with folks that at least to more followers and likes. Let's go over some tips here. So there are three phases, if you will, um, the opportunity that you can use for conference or events related posts before, during, and then after the events. And then we'll go over a different, a little bit of different type of content that we can use for those three phases. Make sure you use the event hashtag that you can usually find on their uh, event page or flyers. Example, example, MPHA had a conference last year, and then I think they repurposed this hashtag mm -hmm. on purpose, mm -hmm. hashtag in the MPHA conference. So the event organizer or conference organizer and participants use this hashtag to follow the conversation around, the top, around this topic or event. So you want your post to be found amongst those people, so make sure you use the hashtag so that they can see you yours and then engage. At the same time, follow the event hashtag and be part of the conversation. Engage with them, liking their posts and talking to them by commenting and, and all that. So this is this is the time that the people get excited is something's happening offline and bring it to online. So it's kind of nice to see that's happening. Mm -hmm. Make sure you tag speakers and participants. This is how you can, again, engage. And then if you have time, do some homework and then find the Twitter handles or some other social media account of the, the speakers so that the, right at the moment, you can tag them. And then they like that. Yeah. <laughs> Here are some useful features that you can use um, for different um, platforms. For Twitter, Twitter thread, thread. So that's the long strings of connected tweets around the same topic. And in, in this case, for the event, you might have a lot of different things to say about one particular speaker, and then you can use the thread to connect them all together. Twitter moments, so that's the curated stories that you can kind of like put together, showcasing what's happening around one topic, around the, um, around the event, using hashtag. And then for Facebook and Instagram, you can use Facebook Live and Instagram Live. Okay, here's some example. This is pre-event. So left one is about community meetings around the Shadak campus um, planning. So this is just to promote um, the event. There's no hashtag here, I don't think. And then right one is around Health Action Conference 2019 is the hashtag HA2019. So they're promoting one of the um, workshops that are happening. So they talk about who's presenting and what topic that is. So this is one of the series of um, the spotlight that they did pre-event. 
So during the event, so this is the exciting part. So it's almost like live report from the event. So this is when a lot of a lot of folks tweeting or even using the, the Facebook or sometimes Instagram, depends on the what kind of event and target audience, and using the same hashtag. So and then sometimes you can find a different hashtag because some folks just come up with it, like HA 2019. Some people, some people just put HA 2019 conference. It's sometimes it's by mistake, but it's okay. Um, but anyway, so you can use the hashtag. Um, you can write about um, learnings from the session that you went to or some booth that I met somebody in a nice conversation that you had at the event quotes from keynote speakers um or even group photos taking at mm -hmm. events i always ask all the folks at the hia <laughs> to take group photos at the event or at the conferences so that we can post on the um, twitter or other social media and then right one is again hashtag ha 2019 so this is right before the, the session that I, um, we did so it was kind of promoting, this is happening pretty soon. So of course, targeted to those participants who are at the conference. Um, they can find it this is because this is part of the conference and they use the hashtag. Hashtag, um, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is post event. So this is a chance that you can thank the organizers, people you met at the event, um, some other participants, partners, you can tag them and you can again start the conversation or engage them. You can talk about your experience at the event, make sure you tag the organizer, they like to see that. And you can share some slide deck of your, of your presentation so that the folks who couldn't make it to your presentation can still see your content. And then again, you can share the photo gallery. People like to see themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter moment. Um, I talked about it a little bit earlier, um, but uh, this is the kind of feature to aggregate the related posts by either yourself or other people um, who use the same hashtag. And this is a nice way to kind of like collect conversation and what happened throughout the event or any other topic. And then Natalie, you mentioned earlier that the Twitter chat, um, Twitter moment is the feature that the, you might be able to use um, to aggregate all the conversation um, throughout the Twitter chat. Okay, question number four. I hear we need to add personality to our social media. How do I do that? <laughs> Here's a way to um, show your sort of like personality or feeling about your brand. Keep it conversational. It's almost like a kind of like talking in person and you don't have to be always really formal or like a official tone or official like formal way. Think about your tone. This is related to your own brand or the sort of like personality of your organization. You can use means quotes and even emoji to show your feeling or to show personality. And then again, these need to be sort of like connected to your brand as well. So if it's too far from it, just don't go there. <laughs> Here's some example. And then again, the 84 movement. I really like this one. Yeah. <laughs> You want to talk about it now? Yeah, I mean, uh, we do this a lot um, on the 84 social media for, you know, kind of answering a couple of these questions that have been identified that need for varied content, trying to have a personality, trying to be engaging, um, because we don't just want to always be posting about our tobacco prevention um, stuff. And to be honest, we don't always have an event or something to promote. So we like to kind of fill our, our social media with some of this other stuff, you know, really asking um, the young people who follow us and just the community that we're building to think about other things outside of just the tobacco topic. Um, so it's, you know, we think about that, we tie images like this to um, tobacco topics. Um, so it kind of 
I don't want to say tricks, but brings people in because they're seeing a nice image like this and, and think that it's cute and think it's a good message um, and then are able to connect it back to us based on what we, how we tie it in through our comments. So um, yeah, we, we use that a lot. Yeah, and then while people really want to get information from your organization, people like to feel good, mm -hmm. you know, about just the feeling. And in this post, you know, give you some good feeling about about this you know but just just a just a moment there and on the right side on training institute um they're talking about recycling but then by using this meme it kind of like gave like chuckle mm -hmm. it's like using the l meme there so there's some personality there okay question number five this is a big one how can i interact with people via social media and we get this question a lot and all the time so here's some ways that you can interact. So, at mention and then tag them. So this is a little bit different across different platforms. For social, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the, the Twitter, for example. Tagging them is almost like just nudging, nudging them. So when you post something, nudging the person, tagging them, your followers will receive the post but then their followers are not going to see unless they retweet. So that's something to think about. And then Facebook and the Instagram is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, based on the, um, you know, Instagram and Facebook are a little bit different because of the algorithms that they use and the way that they identify sort of popular posts and things like that, but it's still really important, I think, on, on across all social media platforms to be as often as possible um, mentioning or at mentioning um, folks a specific handle, and it, it can get a little bit overwhelming because an um, organization might have a different handle on each individual platform, um, but taking that little bit of extra time to search for them on Facebook or search for them on Instagram before you make the post so that you know what their handle is and you can tag them really does make all the difference. Um, it does, like, like Tamaki said on Twitter, it does nudge them. It does bring that person to that post. Um, but through conversation and commenting and liking, it can also raise your profile and raise that post to a lot of other folks who follow you and follow them as well. So it's really um, always a good practice to try and do that as often as possible. And then we'll encourage you all to just mention us. And we are, so I'm behind HRIA social media. And Natalie is behind the 84 movement. And then Kelly is behind the uh, Community Health Training Institute. So please feel free to just at mention us or engage us. And then use this opportunity to practice all you like to do. And then we promise we'll engage back. So I think we, that's something that we like to offer today. Liking them. So you're not going to lose anything by liking them. So, yeah. I, yeah, I think that's one of the most important things is that folks often forget as they're scrolling through or at, especially if you're an organization, social media, um, don't, a lot of organizations or a lot of um, profiles like that don't utilize liking and things like that as, as much as you can, um, because I guess it's seen more as a personal thing. But like Tamaki said, you absolutely do not lose anything in the social media sphere by liking something. Um, that somebody else has posted and it's not as if you like something and then that's that's going to come up all the time or every time someone comments it's going to be in your feed it it is the best way to show some um, engagement on your part with uh, anybody that you want to um, sort of bring into your sphere on social media and it takes no time and it's one of the easiest things to do so really encouraging you to use that function as well yeah, this is the best low hanging fruit thing. Yeah. Can do. And just to share your love, and people love that. Um, retweeting and share with a comment depending on what platform you use, and then make sure that the, you comment and then add your perspective and your wording, your word on it. Um, reply or comment. So again, this is different from platform to platform. In Twitter, you can use the reply and you can see the thread, but this is a little bit different from, because well, there's no comment on the Twitter. 
So you can use reply to kind of attach, attach your comment to the particular tweet. Mm -hmm. And then for other platforms, yeah. that you can reply to particular comment that are made by somebody else. Yes. So that's, again, the threat that you can use. Direct message. So this is kind of like a, for the Facebook, there's some Facebook Messenger. So it's kind of like separate private messaging that you can use. So I'll give you an example. One time I was tagging somebody, some organization, and I tagged incorrectly. And then the person direct messaged me and saying, did you mean to tag us? This is, this is probably similar to this one. So that's how we kind of um, engaged. But then since then, we kind of connected and then started following each other. So that's the kind of interesting way to use that direct message. Direct message is also a really helpful way <laughs> on on uh, Facebook and Instagram, especially if you're wanting to engage with a specific or other organization or a partner or a stakeholder, it's a great way to ask a specific question. Um, and, and sometimes I think, especially in, in our world, we get really attached to email and really attached to this way, but it's really fun, even if you're an organization, to receive a direct message on any of the social media platforms. So if you're, you know, if somebody posts um, a something about an event coming up or a topic, like if you're, they're posting about this webinar, for example, if you had a specific question or wanted to say, hey, I'd really like us, you all to focus more on Facebook in this, on this webinar, you should direct message that um, to, to the organization or you could direct message that CHTI because those kinds of interactions really do, like Tamaki said, could help that engagement further Then you have now identified yourself on social media See, you know, that organization could follow you back and it could create some engagement that way. And then there's a difference. I mean, it's very subtle in terms of how you use it, but a reply and then direct message. Reply is public to everybody. Everybody can see your comment mm -hmm. and direct message is very private. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, this idea about building content and creating content and what that means for each platform. I think what um, tends to happen and what happened to me when I first started doing social media things is I would really, you know, create, get a great idea, get a great photo, create a sort of caption for that photo, and then post the same exact thing on all of my social media platforms. Um, that is something that we would encourage you not to do. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about why that is and what the benefit is into just making even little tweaks and differences for each of the platforms you might be using. Some of you may only be using one platform right now and that's totally fine, but it's still important to understand why um, using the same exact carbon copy content on each platform is not necessarily the most useful for you. So we call this cross-platform posting. So when you have a general idea of something you want to post about, a piece of content that you want to post, it's important if you're going to use that on all the platforms that you have to think about these kind of specific things. First, to think about the length of the caption that you're using, because as I mentioned before, a lot of social media platforms have a character limit in terms of how much you can actually post. And that differs from platform to platform. Think about that image that you're using. Is it the most ideal image formatting for each platform? Um, because you know, Facebook and Instagram have different, a little bit of nuanced difference in terms of the way that images um, should be formatted or the way they end up looking when posted on those platforms. And the last thing is thinking about the, the vocabulary that you're using. It's really different for each platform. So. Whereas on Twitter, it's called retweeting. Um, you wouldn't want to say that in an Instagram post. It doesn't make any sense. So it doesn't make sense to sort of create a caption for a photo that asks somebody to retweet and then just post that on your Instagram as well. It, it won't ring true and it actually looks a little bit sloppy. So those are just a couple of the main things to keep in mind. But we're going to talk about even more in depth some things to remember. So like I said, that different language piece is important. Following, retweeting, sharing, liking, all of those, the, all of these sort of words that we use for a social media realm can be different depending on the platform. So 
if you're going to make a specific post that and you do want someone to retweet or you do want someone to follow you, make sure that you're editing that and changing that language for each of the different platforms. The other thing is that we talked about tagging people and how that's really important on platforms. But as I mentioned, most of the time, people and organizations don't have the same handle on every single platform. So my Instagram handle and how you find me on Instagram is a totally different name or has you find me a totally different way than how you would on Facebook. Same with the 84 and our, and our platforms there. A lot of folks try to keep it consistent, but it doesn't always work out depending on, on the platform. So if you want to tag someone, make sure that you're tagging it them appropriately for the given platform. The other thing that I think um, is a common mistake, especially if you're starting to first utilize social media, is that some of these platforms like Twitter and Instagram and, and Facebook, they have the function for you to connect all of your social media. So like, for example, Instagram, you can connect your Facebook to your Instagram, and then all it takes is clicking a little button when you're about ready to post your Instagram post and say, yeah, post it to Facebook as well. It seems like it would be a really big time saver. It seems like it'd be something that would be totally useful. It's actually not. Um, when you do that, the posts from Instagram on Facebook, it shows up as a link to your Instagram. And like I said, all of these things we spoke about before, like the language and the handle does not translate. So it actually doesn't always, isn't always the best method to use as it would be to just take it over and post it on your Facebook on your own. The other thing to think about is that you very likely have duplicate followers on your different platforms. So people who you are, who are liking you on Facebook are probably also following you on Instagram. Um, you probably have some of that repeat. So imagine that person looks at their Facebook that day, sees a post from you, then looks at their Instagram and it's the exact same post with the exact same wording. Um, it, like before, it seems a little bit lazy. It doesn't seem a bit as fluid as if you would have just changed the message a little bit. And the last two things is sort of related to what we talked about before, really catering that message for your audience, depending on which platform you're posting. And it really is helpful in, as you're starting to do this and starting to cater your content for each platform to look at the analysis on the back end. Every social media platform has its own kind of analytics that you can look at uh, and see which of your posts are getting the most likes, which of them are getting the most comments and see what's working. So we do that all the time with the 84. So when we started posting, we saw that when we started posting more memes and jokes and things like that, those posts tended to get the more, lot more likes, more comments. Um, we also got more likes and comments on posts where we featured pictures of few people in our chapters. So we started to use that content a lot more. That's a good validation of using yeah. a different kind of content. Yeah, absolutely. So you might be wondering, I just said a lot of words at you, and um, you might be wondering, how does this actually look in practice? So I'm going to actually walk you through a couple of examples of how a piece of content for social media and a message was adapted for individual platforms. And we're going to use a wide variety of examples here. So the first one I have for you is from Warby Parker, the glasses making company that is wonderful that I use often. Um, and this is an example of here, the piece of content was they were highlighting a new store that they were opening up in Fort Worth, Texas. So these are two different posts on their individual platforms. The one um, on the left is their post on Twitter. And this is a static image, just the final product of what their actual store ended up looking like at the end with um, a link there to the Warby Parker website, I believe that is. And it just has um, a great image there. If you look to the uh, picture on the right, this is on the, their Instagram page. So this is about the same type of content. As you see, the message didn't change a whole lot. They were identifying that this is our new store in Fort Worth, Texas. But because they were using Instagram, they know that Instagram is a great platform for short form video. 
So that's actually a time-lapse video. This is a screenshot, so I won't be able to play it for you, but that's actually a time-lapse video of what the store looked like when they started and then goes through all the way into what it looks like now. So that's a way different piece of content than just the static picture. And it's really a cool thing to be able to use. So they knew, but they knew that Twitter is not really the place for that kind of video. So they put it here on their Instagram. And then if you see in the caption, it says um, swipe to see the final results. So they also posted the remaining pictures of the actual store. So this is a way that they took the same idea. We want to advertise, we have a new store and they changed it and altered the content a little bit depending on which platform they were using. So here I'm gonna show a little bit um, of how sort of that original content piece that Tamaki was talking about. So this is an example from the uh, Community Health and Training Institute. So CHTI posted to their website, this blog sort of entry, highlighting their cohort applications that had opened up back in December. So this on the left was their website post. So they took that and they, the content was, we wanna feature our own website posts on our social media platforms. They did something really great here where they translated, when they translated that into Twitter, they added the link to the actual um, uh, website so that you were drawn back to the website. So they're using their social media platform to get traffic back to their website, which is where they want you to be. And they just did sort of a short form intro sentence here. This is on their Twitter. So they didn't post a long paragraph explanation about what the uh, health equity cohort was on their Twitter because it's not really appropriate. They want short, snappy message. And then they get let the link do the talking for them. Um, so they post a little sentence here to get you interested. They threw in a hashtag to make sure that they were drawing attention to it, to the subject and then they link you back to their actual website to get all of the information there. So this is an example from us on the 84. So this is really highlighting that idea about um, tagging folks and how that can change whether you are on Facebook or you're on Instagram. So you'll see here on the left, this is our Facebook page. And what we did here was we had, we saw a, I believe this is a tweet from the campaign for tobacco free kids. And we wanted, we really liked that tweet and we wanted to highlight it on some of our other social media platforms. So what we did here on Facebook is we um, were able to link to that tweet. So on Facebook, we could add a link to back to the actual Tobacco Free Kids Twitter page. So we added that here and added our own comment to it, which Tamaki identified as something important when you're using curated content. We added our own little caption there. So that's what we did on Facebook. On Twitter, it's a, or on Instagram, it's a whole different story for us because Instagram does not allow you in a caption to link back to something. It doesn't allow you to post a link that you can actually click on and be generated there. So instead what we did was we took a screenshot of the tweet from Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, wrote our own comment again there. It does. We did provide the link, but it's not one that you can click on. If somebody really wanted to go visit that actual Twitter, they could copy and paste it. But instead, to give Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids kids the credit, we tag them. So if you see here on this image, um, you can see this little black box that appears like when you hover over the image on Instagram. And you can see that we tag tobacco free kids in this Instagram post so that we're still drawing traffic back to them through that and not just taking their tweet um, and sort of posting it for our own. Um, and because we can't link directly to the Twitter from here. So that was a way for us to connect to them um, through Instagram. So this is another example from us on the 84, and this is the last example I'll sort of give you. And this is sort of highlighting that change in lang little bit of change in language depending on your audience. So for us, Facebook is really a platform that we use to engage adults 
using it to engage the adult advisors um, that work with the young people in our chapters. We use it to engage other folks in tobacco prevention. So we know that we're really catering to adults on this platform. So if you notice, same image, very similar text, but the wording is a little bit different because it asks the, it's calling out adult advisors specifically and saying, if you know a young person who'd be interested in applying for our Youth Leadership Award, please let us know. And it's really calling attention to the adult advisors right there in that post because we know that that's our audience on that platform. Whereas if you look on the right, this was the post that we put on Instagram. And Instagram, we know, is where most of our, the youth in our program are following us. So we change the text to talk directly to the young person and say, if you, a young person, would like to apply, please let us know. So that might not seem like that big of a deal. It might not seem um, like it's, it's a huge change, because it's not. <laughs> it's not a huge change. So when you're thinking about posting on different platforms, sometimes it can seem very tedious and time consuming, but we're talking about minor changes that you can make to make sure the message resonates on each of these platforms, like we did here with just the change of a few words. So what I'd like to do, and we're gonna see how this works, um, is I've posted here a tweet from HRIA, and it is a quote from one of our coworkers um, that happened at the MPHA conference. So this is a quote that she said, and this is the uh, tweet that we put on our Twitter page. What I'd like to hear from you all is, what could we do to this tweet, or how could we make this tweet more appealing if we wanted to now go and post the same information on Instagram? So what I'm gonna ask you to do, and again, we'll see how this works, is in, this, in the chat function, I'd love for you to just type out some ideas. What could we do with this piece of um, data here that we have that we could change to make it engaging on Instagram? So just type it, your suggestions into the chat box and Tamaki and I will kind of look at that and see, see what we can do see what comes up. All right, so we have some folks saying, make the quote into an image um, through something like Canva. That's great. Um, use a photo, make the quote a graphic, put the speaker's photo. Um, so a lot of folks are saying feature either feature a photo of Elena um, or take the quote and put it in some sort of graphic form, which is great. On Instagram, you have more characters, so we could add some more detail into that combo. You're exactly right. You turn the quote into an image or a post so you can use the, um, and use the quote as a caption. Yeah, so these are great, great examples, and that's exactly what um, some of the things that we would have done. I think the, the most you know, obvious thing is to make this visual, mm -hmm. um, to make this quote visual. So by either using a photo from the conference with featuring Elena, hopefully, or taking a photo of the conference, like a general photo of the conference, overlaying the quote on top of it. And if we have the quote in the image, um, like we saw with some of the examples that Tamaki showed earlier, then we don't necessarily need to re-quote it in the, in the caption. We could say something else about the conference in the caption. We could thank MPHA. Um, I think another thing that's important to think about that I just want to continue to mention is that the, this Twitter handle for MPHA, the Massachusetts Public Health Association, that might not be what their Twitter or their handle is on Instagram. So making sure that we're using the right handle when we're tagging them um, and things like that, maybe even tagging Elena um, as our employee if she feels comfortable with that. But I think you all really identified some of the things that would make this a lot more um, appealing in terms of posting it on Instagram. This is on the side note. This post was during the event, during the conference that happened last year. And this is, Elena, this is a kind of question that the Elena submitted to, to this event and then they, they talked about. So there's another thing that we could, we could do is related to this comment, 
what was happening around the time. And then there might be some other folks that you could attack. Maybe somebody you're sitting next to or somebody else who made a similar comment. Mm -hmm. So those are other ideas during the event. Absolutely. So now we're going to kind of turn our attention to, we talked a lot about what that content can be, what it can look like, which platforms are best to utilize for the content, but how do you plan it? (laughs) Because I think one of the biggest struggles for folks is that we have all this content, but like, how do I make it sustainable for me as an employee in terms of posting every day or posting at least three, three times a week or whatever you want to do, how can I make that a little bit more regimented? Because I think all of us know that social media is very fast paced and in the moment, it does not mean you can't schedule it. So this is just a little bit of a tie back into what we said earlier. This is the same slide from earlier in the presentation that Tamaki went over, but I just wanted to uh, touch on that again, making sure that you know, understanding that you're not alone in this, you do not have to create all of your own content all the time, remembering that 60, or that 631 rule, 60% curated from external sources, 30% of your own content, and 10% promotional. These are just a couple of things to to touch base on again, Um, the idea about using hashtags that are relevant to your posts. So Tamaki mentioned this earlier, that sometimes there are hashtags that are trending already on those social media platforms. So if you're just posting something general and you're not really sure how to engage in those conversations, try to look at those trending hashtags and see if you can get creative about using them. Using eye-catching images, making sure and including links, uh, links for things on platforms that are appropriate, like on Twitter, and always tagging folks when you um, want to get their attention, especially if you are thinking about posting content from a project that you're working on or anything that you uh, have created with the um, sort of help of a partner, Mm -hmm. making sure and tagging those partner organizations or funders in your posts. So in terms of planning, here we have, we used this last time in our uh, previous webinar, but I think it's important to touch base on again, is this idea about when is the best time to be posting on some of these platforms if I'm going to schedule out my posts to go um, and be posted throughout the week, when should I be planning to schedule them? So each platform is a little bit different, obviously, because it depends on who's using it and why they're using it and when they're using it. So you can see here the best times for Twitter, generally 12 o'clock, three o'clock and five to six. This is really like lunchtime, that mid afternoon lull when you're bored and that commute home. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's pretty clear there. Um, And as you can see in the middle, Twitter users are 181% more likely to be on Twitter during their commute. Hopefully not the ones who are driving, um, <laughs> but that's a really important thing to know. So it might not make sense to post something at 10 a.m. Um, because they may not see it by the time they open up their, their Twitter, your message might be gone. Yeah, and then this is different from other um, platforms that, that there's an algorithm there. And once you post it for Facebook, for example, once somebody comment on it, oh, come back, come on back to the top of the, t- the, the yeah. wall, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Twitter, that doesn't happen. Yeah, Twitter is, like we've said before, very fast paced, very fast moving. So you, you, you tweet it, whoever doesn't see it, it's not gonna see yeah. it five hours later. Yeah, and then I like to kind of point out the Wednesday around noon, um, a lot of Twitter chat is scheduled around Wednesday, at noon or some afternoon so this is some there's mm-hmm. some reason for that yeah so for facebook um this is just some information breakdown right there best times around 9 a.m um 1 p.m and 3 p.m as you can see there those are the times that folks get the most shares and the most uh, clicks so i think again that a little bit mirrors what we saw earlier in terms of maybe around lunchtime maybe in that afternoon um boredom time at work um but facebook is a total is it also really different thing because of the nature of Facebook, it tends to be more engaging. So folks not, are not necessarily going and checking Facebook just to kind of like scroll through and be done. 
they want to maybe check Facebook if they're going to spend a little bit more time commenting or looking through what people have read, which is why I think it, it identifies here that one of the best times to post is on weekends for Facebook. You know, you're thinking about people who are on there looking at events to go to are on there reading more long uh, form posts from their friends. So I think that that's something Thing, um, that's different about Facebook than opposed to Twitter or something like that. Um, so thinking about also this idea of posting on Fridays, I know for our 84 um, social medias, we tend to post something lighter and funnier and happier going into the weekend um, because it really kind of fits the mood of folks who are on social media on a Friday, especially in the afternoon or towards the end of the day. Yeah, and then that might be a good time to use memes or quotes or any other content type that brings some fun. Yeah. And then here's for Instagram. So I think this is exactly how you might imagine, um, nine, eight, between 8 and 9 a.m. or 5 p.m., which is outside of work hours. I think folks, again, um, are using this a lot on commuting, um, heading into work or after work. So I think that the middle, this middle um, sort of fact is the most interesting to me, that posting a video at 9 a.m. on Instagram gets 34% more interactions. This is something that I'm guilty of, of, you know, about 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., getting into bed and scrolling through my Instagram at the end of the day. So that makes sense to me as someone who's addicted to their phone. But, uh, and I think that this obviously brings true for a lot of other people. So that's just something to keep in mind about Instagram as well. Um, and, and also remembering that Instagram is the most mobile of all. Mm -hmm. So we went over a lot now about um, creating social media content so far. And I like to post for a second for commercial break. <laughs> are we ready for this? So most of us who work on the social media don't do this full time, including myself, Natalie, and then Kelly. And we might feel like we're always behind in creating social media, I mean, it's creating content on social media. And that's normal, and that's okay. And we want all of you to, to, to know that. So let's do what we can. And even two posts or one post a week is awesome. It's awesome. So social media could be scary or intimidating to some people. So I would like to empower you all and then give a permission to be realistic on what you can do within the time that you have. So yeah, you're doing the best and that's good enough. <laughs> okay, now um, the time for tools and resources. Yeah, so we're just gonna touch base on a couple of things um, to leave you with to sort of explore in terms of helping you deal with that social media stress you might be having. Um, the biggest thing that I want to mention is Hootsuite. I mentioned it earlier when I was showing that graphic we had a Hootsuite is, is a lot of things. Um, it is a great website in general to ha get articles about, you know, when's the best time to post on things, those cross-cutting plat cross, uh, platform posting strategies. Um, it, it's just in general a, a breadth of knowledge about social media. In addition, it's also a really helpful and useful tool for scheduling your social media. So this is actually on the screen, a screenshot of our, so our Hootsuite for the 84 movement. You can see here that we have linked our Twitter, our Facebook, and our Instagram all to Hootsuite. And it allows us to not only put our content in here and schedule it and you know, make sure that it's gonna go out automatically on its own after we schedule, but it also allows us to look at our content that we might wanna be taking in on these platforms a little bit easier. So especially for Twitter, instead of having to scroll through the whole Twitterverse and, and find things, um, we're, we're able to make lists um, that sort of collect all the information for us so we can view it here. So we're not gonna go in really in depth about Hootsuite. I did go a little bit more in depth about Hootsuite in our last webinar. So I encourage you to go watch that webinar if you want more information about how to use the platform. Um, but I really encourage you to check it out. It is free for the sort of starter base level um, 
package like that we use for the 84. This is another thing that I think is really important. There are a million different content calendars out there on the internet. If you Google social media content calendar, you can find a lot of templates that are really helpful to use. Um, we use one for the 84 <clears throat> so that in addition to using Hootsuite to actually go in and schedule them, we actually use a content calendar to plan out every week to say, okay, so this week we really wanna be promoting our event coming up. This week, let's do a wellness week. And so we will plan out our content that way. And it is so easy to use once you're able to do that. And it makes the day-to-day -day maintenance of using social media a lot less of a heavy lift. Um, you can kind of, at the beginning of the month, plan out kind of what your month is gonna look like. And then you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about that every single week. So these are just a couple of other things to mention. As I said before, for scheduling, using, Ho using Hootsuite is really helpful. For analytics and engagement, as I mentioned before, there are analytics really built into every single platform on its own, but there are also other sites you can use to get even further analytics. Um, here are some ones listed out there for Facebook and for Twitter. Um, they all kind of have their own functions in terms of how they help you organize your analytics, um, how they help you schedule things. So we won't go too specifically about what each one is for, but I encourage you to look into all of them and see what works for you. The other thing, um, Instagram also has um, some of this too, but Instagram also has a pretty robust um, analytics on their own, on the back end of, of the website itself. I will also mention that Hootsuite will do that too. So if you link all of your, your social medias to Hootsuite like we do, Hootsuite will provide analytics for you as well. So a lot of things that we talked about today came from mm -hmm. these sources. So they're from Hootsuite, like Natalie said, HubSpot, or um, Sprout Social. Those are great resources that you can use. Um, they're great blog post um, talking about the particular piece of social media and you can find them uh, a lot of them and some tools that I, I mentioned earlier um, for creating images you can use they're all like free um, online tools here canva snappa and for creating quote images um, you could use Quozio and in any other um, online free, again, free tools available if you Google them. And then for memes, um, you could use Inger, Inkflip, is that the pronunciation? <laughs> <laughs> so you could use a lot of um, free tools out there. So this is Kayla's favorite too. <laughs> um, I always like to use this analogy. Um, social media is like free puppy. It's free, but I, it required someone to take care of the puppy. It means you need to learn and understand your puppy. And it is ongoing work. You can't just stop taking care of the puppy. It's a living thing. Um, but we talked about multiple platforms today. Um, and I like to stress that it's okay not to use multiple, multiple platforms if, if, you know, if, if, if that's what you can do. It's okay to just give love to one puppy or two, and then that's fine, and that's more than enough. Mm -hmm. So let's yeah. give some love and embrace it. Yeah. So I think now um, we have some time to address some questions that have come up throughout the webinar. Um, I see one right off the bat, a couple of folks asking about copyright issues related to using memes or GIFs. This is a great question. Um, so first of all, I would say that in general, when we're talking about media like that with memes and GIFs and stuff like that, they typically fall under what is called fair use images. So anything that's created um, to like anything that's created by someone for to not be used um, for um, profit it, and it's used to for the purposes of commenting on something providing criticism reporting teaching making a parody all of those types of things are sort of protected under fair and 
what we would classify as a fair use image. So it's okay to use without, <clears throat> there's no like copyright laws against that using it, you can use it and don't have to worry about it. The Supreme Court actually has already ruled on this and said that anything that is considered a parody or a satire is considered a fair use image. So most of the time that memes and gifts fall under that because they're using, it's a commentary on a piece of media that's already been made. So um, you're free to use it. On the other hand, um, for photos and imagery, right. that's something you want to think about um, that's attached to somebody's rights. And if you want to use free um, images and free rights, um, you can Google Creative Commons and a lot of um, images available for use. I would also say if you're worried about that, that's why we provided some tools where you can create your own memes and your own GIFs. So if you're worried about repurposing somebody else's, um, you can do that as well. The other questions that we have. Um, Let's see, the pros and cons of having a social media account um, scarcely used by an organization due to staff capacity. Uh, I think this is a really great question. In general, I think, I mean, it's not doing anybody any harm to have an account sitting there not necessarily being utilized very often. It's not, but it's not doing you any good either. It's just kind of existing. Um, so it, it's not like it's super negative. The only thing that I think is not so great about it is if somebody is learning about your organization or you are promoting that you have social media um, mm -hmm. like on your website or something and someone goes and clicks there and the last time you posted on it was 2016 that doesn't look as great so if it exists but you're not necessarily promoting it it sort of is what it is um, and if you don't have capacity then that's totally okay for where your organization's at I would say make sure and not promote that social media page then um, because I think it does start to get a little bit negative if you're promoting the social media page but you're not updating it. Mm -hmm. Yeah and another con is um, there are tools that uh, kind of help you follow or unfollow or like or unlike so that tool is looking at when was the last time you posted so if, if the folks that are that following you are using that kind of tool that you might lose some followers or likes mm -hmm. if you're inactive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think I sort of answered some of the uh, questions about posting on multiple platforms at once. Um, you can still do that if you'd like. I'd encourage you not to. I'd encourage you to use a site like Hootsuite that puts it all in one space for you, so you don't have to log in and out of all your different platforms, but I would encourage you to change the messaging of the um, thing depending on the platform. Can you please repeat the frequency you recommend for how often to post on Instagram? That's great. I actually don't think we mentioned how often to post on each platform, um, but I think that it really depends on the goals that you have and um, for each of those platforms. If you're trying to grow your Instagram, presence, for example, I would say posting at least three to four times a week, um, I think is important. But again, you can schedule those out. Um, I think it depends also on if you have something to promote or something happening. For the 84, we try to post on Instagram at least three times a week if we don't have something like major happening. If we have an event coming up or something more to promote, then we'll post more often. Um, but at least three times a week is what we use. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Somebody asked about LinkedIn. Um, that's a great question. That's a great <laughs> question. Um, we didn't touch a lot about LinkedIn. We don't use LinkedIn at all with the 84 uh, because we're primarily youth focused um, sort of program. We don't find that it's really useful for us. Um, but I think it depends on, I'm not really sure what your organization looks like or what the purpose would be for using LinkedIn if you are trying to create more networking opportunities um, through there. I'm not as well versed with LinkedIn in terms of um, that. And I think we are uh, kind of exploring the, the LinkedIn's possibility right now. Um, but what I've observed is that if you're posting as organizations and then the engagement is, most of the time likes because in LinkedIn, 
people are looking for a person, actually. That's, that's the platform to connect people to people. So once when we posted something and then one of our employees engaged and that's when the conversation started. So I would think that I'm still testing that out, but uh, I would think that the LinkedIn really needs to involve like staff level or just the person individual because those folks have their own profile. That's how you can sort of like engage people to people. And an organization is more like broadcasting, so to speak, um, the message out there. And that's kind of conversation starter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question about suggestions for building a following. Um, it seems like we're posting, but we're not really getting a lot of engagement. <clears throat> This is a great question. I think that the first thing to say is to have patience. Um, depending upon depending on what your organization is, it can take a while to grow a social media present. It's not like we're celebrities <laughs> who can just post a picture and get thousands of followers in one day. You know, we as the 84, we're a youth tobacco prevention program. Is it the most exciting thing to engage in on social media? Absolutely not. So I think be patient is number one. The practical tips, I think, in terms of building a following, hashtags are your best friend. So I think if you are not using hashtags as well or not maybe as well versed in, in the ways to use hashtags or the nuances of using hashtags, I would maybe do a little bit of research on that. Like um, Hootsuite has a lot of great articles about this and because that can draw folks to your page um, without having to do a lot of outreach. It, it's a really great way to just get people engaged with a specific topic. The more general the hashtag, the more people you're going to reach. So I think that's a really good way. And I think really thinking about the types of content you're using. Are you using the same type of content over and over again? Are you really varying it up with photos, with um, GIFs and memes? Are you... Um, doing that mention thing that we talked about at mentioning specific organizations that you would hope are following you. Those kinds of things are really helpful in terms of getting engagement, but it also just takes time. Mm, let's see. So Tamaki, I don't know if you want to answer this one. Do you have a suggestion on where to find the best content available for specific health areas? I know you post a lot of different information in mm -hmm. terms of public health on our Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna use substance use prevention. So um, I would start with all of the news updates that you subscribe, and those are the great um, organizations that you can get information from, and Samsung is one of them. And then go to, so I'm just gonna use the Twitter as an example, say go to Samsung's site, and then look at who are following them, and then also who they are following. So those are kind of really connected and kind of expand um, that sort of like network around substance use and substance use um, diseases. Great. Um, just doing a time check here. Do we, what, uh, what does our time look like, Kelly? Yes. Yeah, so we have a six minutes left. So I think we still have a few questions okay. left, but um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, make another poll live and this is our end of the training evaluation. So it's five questions. Uh, your feedback is super important to us uh, so we know what we can improve for next time. So while you answer these quick five questions, um, I'll let Natalie and Tamaki continue answering your questions. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions is, do we have an opinion on other cross-posting platforms like Buffer.com and Later.com um, and how they compare to Hootsuite? So what I would say about this is that I wouldn't necessarily say I have a lot of expertise in those other sites. I have used them off and on. The reason that I use Hootsuite is because I have just found it more user friendly. Um, I think that it is also a much more comprehensive platform than others. It does provide a lot of additional services that I think are easier to use. I think I find their analytics are easier to digest. Um, I think Hootsuite also tends to have less bumps in terms of posting and making things um, like the schedule posts going out on time. I've had problems with other platforms in that area. So Hootsuite has always tended to be the one that I use. I also think just in general, there are more established 
um, brand. And so I tend to just use them. They have a great option for their free level package. And a lot of other websites don't provide you with as many options and as many um, sort of elements to it that for free. And, and so I think, I don't know, for me personally, I like Hootsuite. I would encourage you to try other cross uh, posting pages if you'd like, see what works best for you. I, I just like to promote Hootsuite because I think that they're a really great um, site. Um, and then another question is how often should you change or shouldn't you your cover page? Um, I'm not exactly sure what this is asking in terms of like your on like your post pin tweet on Twitter or your your cover photos on Facebook. Not well, exactly sure. Probably like cover cover photo on the top. That's yeah, if you if the person you submit that question, if you want to um, submit a clarifier, that'd be great. But I'll I'll just kind of answer for what I think you're asking, um, and I think as often as it what you have becomes irrelevant. So we um, so the the photos that we use on our cover page and like our profiles and things like that, we change as often as we have sort of new content or new photos of young people from our events. So we'll generally keep them up there until um, we have another event that has sort of outpaced that. So we try to update it whenever we have new, new content to post like that. I think in terms of Twitter and highlighting like your pinned tweet or something like that, again, as much as it's relevant, you don't really want to have a tweet pinned up there that's from a conference from two months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of think about the relevancy of it um, and, and decide from there. There's not really a, an equation for it, I would say. But Yeah, um, this, is, this is probably like seems obvious, but uh, in terms of the cover image there, and then if you change it often, do you like, um, make sure that's related, you know, that's relevant to your, your brand. Mm -hmm. 84, you change the, the photos, but uh, you can see the young people. You can see that the, they're wearing um, the 84 t-shirt, so that that's, that's part of the brand, so people can recognize it. Right, oh, cover photo on Twitter, yeah, same yeah. thing, yeah. So that's great, yeah. Um, yeah, making sure that it aligns with your brand and that it's updated, you know, um, and I think as long as you have, whenever you have more updated photos is, is probably fine, as long as that image is, is really on brand for you. I think that's it in terms of the questions. Um, thank you all too for filling out that survey. I will continue to keep doing that. And then I'll just turn things over. Okay, so thank you all for filling out that evaluation. Uh, like I said, these trainings are not set in stone and we really do appreciate your feedback to inform our upcoming trainings too. Uh, speaking of, we have a few upcoming trainings coming, which I'm going to share on our other laptop. So bear with me just a moment. So we have one coming up in May called Deconstructing Structural Racism, Examining the History and Systems to Make Change. And so this was initially supposed to or part of our health equity cohort, but because of overwhelming uh, popularity and demand, we really wanted to make an additional training open to the public. So that will be led in Worcester on May 14th from 9 to 12 um, with Mo Barboza from Health Resources in Action and Lori Lobenstein from the Design Studio for Social Intervention. They'll also be doing a webinar as well called Health Equity and Cross-Sector Partnerships, and that will be on May 14th with the time and registration uh, date to be determined, uh, which is also led by Mo and Laurie. You'll be receiving a copy of the slides in your email, along with the recording of the webinar. Um, and we thank you for your time and all of your really thoughtful questions, and you will be hearing from us shortly, uh, but enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.